What is your role in Manchester Modernist Society and what does it do for the city? Um, well, I act as an advisor, an architectural advisor to the Manchester Modernist Society. Um, and I think its role in the city has really been to galvanise a group of disparate but interested and passionate people. Um, I think you'd have to ask them specifically what their aims are, um, but in terms of the way that they engage with people, uh, it's largely about trying to celebrate uh, modern and modernist architecture through fun, really. Can you tell us the differences between conserving a modern and a Victorian building? Uh, well, I haven't worked on the conservation of either, uh, and I think that you know you have to consider uh, two words in this context: conservation and preservation. Uh, and I personally am not a preservationist, um, and I think the conservation of buildings is obviously subject to a great deal uh, of kind of political uh, input, really, into the value. Of buildings. So I think <coughs> the biggest difference at the moment is that uh, Victorian buildings are very much valued. The public see their value uh, and modern buildings are not necessarily perceived in the same way. Uh, you know, once you get into the technicalities of conservation, uh, it's largely a discourse about materiality, about continuity. Can we conserve things that are non-physical? It's uh, an interesting question. Uh, I think so, yeah. I think we have to talk about uh, space, uh, and I think this position we're in now is an absolutely perfect example. You know, you might not necessarily consider these buildings individually as the best examples of mainstream modernism in the post-war era, yet the collection of buildings, uh, the spaces in between the buildings, uh, the volumes, the way in which they administer the spatial sequence of this particular part of the city uh, is second to none in its quality. So, yeah, I'd suggest that you can conserve the idea uh, behind modernism, you can idea, conserve the idea of space, uh, and you can conserve all the sort of fantastic work that's been done there. So, what is special about Eunice then? Uh, Eunice, uh, all sorts of things are special about Eunice. Uh, I mean, Eunice itself. Uh, emerged historically from the Manchester Mechanics Institute, so it's got a very uh, rich association with engineering history uh, and technology history in the city. Um, equally, there was a certain amount of work went on here uh, in the Second World War, uh, in aid of the war, and several things were patented uh, that, that helped us in our, at that time. And most importantly, it embraces uh, the white heat of technology. Uh, Mark Millen's kind of post-war dream. Uh, it, it's second really only to Imperial College London uh, in terms of its prominence as, a, as an institute for the research of science and engineering and technology. And in architectural terms, uh, this was really a collection of uh, Manchester's finest architects came together uh, to work on this scheme. Uh, Lord Bowden, who was the principal at the time, worked for Ferranti and as such was familiar with uh, the work of Arthur Gibbon for Crookshank and Seward. However, uh, Hubert Worthington of Wor Thomas Worthington and Sons uh, had a long established relationship with the various educational institutes. And so Worthington, uh, Gibbon, uh, Seward Senior uh, and Harry Fairhurst all came together uh, to work collectively on this particular campus. Uh, and university minutes show uh, that it's not actually the hand of one designer, but actually the, the Manchester glitter art eye of the time uh, coming together to create this space. So I think it's value uh, kind of culturally and nationally, uh, but also particularly locally and regionally to uh, the kind of architectural scene. It's really important. In a slightly wider context, which of the modern movements affected the city the most, do you think? Uh, I think you have to look at the post-war period uh, you have to consider uh, mainstream modernism, um, like the buildings we see behind us. Um, for the first time, British architecture wholesale embraced uh, the modern movement and the ideas of modernism. If you look into the interwar period in Britain, much modern architecture is made uh, by elites for elites. Uh, there, there, there are few buildings, really, that are 
uh, public in that regard. Bexhill, uh, the pavilion, the Delaware Pavilion at Bexhill is probably the best example. That was by a pair of emigre architects. So here we're looking at uh, British born, British trained architects who grew up uh, being taught about Le Corbusier, about Walter Gropius and the Bauhaus. And really this was the first time that these guys got to uh, experiment with those techniques. And these are people, they're not part of the avant-garde in the 1950s and 60s, they're not part of a discourse involving the AA or the Smithsons or even uh, Sterling necessarily. Uh, these, these are people going about the business of commercial architecture. Which is the most important building in Manchester and why? Interesting question. Sort of like asking a skateboarder how high can you ollie, isn't it? Um, I think uh, every building in the city has its own particular qualities. I think it's hard to pull out one that's more important uh, than another. I think that there isn't a particular building of international significance uh, from the 20th century that, that jumps out. Um, but I think it's about in tying the history of the buildings to the culture of the place in terms of measuring their value. Um, so in that regard, you'd have to look at somewhere like the CIS Tower, you know, which emerged from 150 years of cooperation. You know, that building doesn't exist because somebody had a load of money and wanted to build some edifice to their own might. You know, it's actually uh, grown effectively with the cooperative movement uh, and obviously embraced a uh, kind of international style. It was the tallest building in Europe uh, when it was built uh, and remained so for some years. Certainly it was the tallest building in this city for the next almost 50 years until Beacon Tower was made. So, I think if I was to try and single something out, I think it would be CIS, but really for its uh, cultural connection to the place, uh, rather than for anything to do with its aesthetics or its technology. Who decides which buildings are important to the city and should be kept? Is it subjective or objective? Is it? Uh, it's very subjective. Um, we're no longer in a situation where we have an overriding master plan. Uh, that governs the city. Uh, you know, these buildings in the 1960s uh, were part of a development plan which had comprehensive development areas which had three dimensional spatial designs for them. And so the value of buildings in relation to other buildings in the city and their overall value to the city was determined through a discourse uh, with the planners who were well informed architect planners in those days, a lot of them had trained as architects before making the transition to urban designers and planning. Uh, some of them had been schooled uh, at Liverpool, which was a fantastic school of urban design at the time. So today uh, we're in a situation where every building is judged on a case by case basis uh, and should a developer come forward and want to assemble a parcel of land and bring something new to the city, uh, then often the city is keen to embrace newness. Uh, and so I think that in Manchester at the moment there's a tendency to value Victorian architecture and to value new architecture, uh, but architecture of the mid-century isn't necessarily uh, seen as valuable despite its rise in, in f fashionability. Uh, amongst a sort of certain class, it's still not viewed as uh, useful uh, or, or, or to be usefully re-engaged by the general populace. Um, and so we have a planning system, we have conservation areas, uh, we have means of public inquiry, um, but all of those really can be overridden uh, by clever consultants with enough finance. How can a subculture one might belong to affect their work in the field of architecture? Uh, I think that's really to do with the immersive uh, effects of the study and the practice of architecture. I think you'll know as students uh, it's very difficult to engage with the subject without completely immersing oneself in it. Uh, and I see my musical tastes uh, as being parallel to uh, my general love for things functional industrial, uh, minimal, uh, all of those things can be applied equally to uh, 
uh, electronic and the production of electronic music as they can architecture. So I think it, it's about a, a level of personal immersion, and obviously that's still very, very subjective. You practice for several years. How useful is practice in teaching? Oh, extremely useful, and vice versa. Uh, the two go hand in hand. Uh, I think architecture, anyway, is a lifelong learning experience, uh, and any architect uh, worth their salt in practice, whether they're teaching in a university setting or, or not, they're teaching themselves constantly. Um, so the, the, the two, learning and the practice of architecture, are, are parallel with one another, and you, need, you can't have one without the other. I always wanted to write, and uh, I was trying to squeeze uh, the margins really with, with trying to write and practice and teach. Uh, so teaching full time gives me the opportunity to research. At last, what advice would you give someone who practices now and wants to become an academic? Uh, engage with your passion, uh, immerse yourself, uh, and be patient. Uh, it's not uh, an easy track. I was thinking about this. I know people who, who would like to become uh, architectural academics who are students at the moment, who are practitioners. Uh, and I think you just have to be patient. Uh, there's not many schools of architecture in the UK necessarily. Uh, so you have to be willing to travel. Uh, you have to be possibly willing to move, uh, relocate. Uh, but I think genuinely uh, embrace your passion, develop a, a culture of research that is your own uh, regardless of any aim or intent uh, to transpose that into an academic setting. And then I think your, your, your passion and hard work hopefully manifests itself uh, in something that's valuable uh, culturally to the teaching and the, the, the practice of architecture and that your peers uh, and those judging you see uh, the value of those things so I guess simply sort of work hard, do something you love.